Today I've chosen two passages of scripture to share with you. We have one listed, but I added another one is part of our lesson that's in our daily planning book. And I think it fits well with our thoughts today. It comes from the book of James, the third chapter, verses 13, and then the fourth chapter to verse eight. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above. It is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, good fruits without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? They did not come from your cravings or at war within you. You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and you cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on pleasures. Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy, therefore, of God. Or do you suppose that it's for nothing that the scripture says, God yearns jealousy for the spirit that is made to dwell in us, but it gives all the more grace Therefore, he says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And then our gospel today comes to Mark, the ninth chapter, as you have found listed in your bulletin. They, the disciples and Jesus, went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was out in the house with them, what are you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way he had argued with one another, well, who is the greatest? He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, whoever wants to be first must be the last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it to his arms, he said, whoever welcomes one such as this child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. It is a joy to be with you here at Oak Grove. I've been here once back in the day when a former pastor was here, and I, as you heard, I played in the uh, uh, band that Oak Grove put together for the Walker Town Parade, so I enjoy being here. And I have been many places. I feel like Johnny Cash. I've been everywhere. Uh, I started off life at Mispa. Charlie Fitz was my baptism pastor. I went from Mispa, went to school at Wingate, then Guilford, then Moravian Seminary. So I've been to many churches in Pennsylvania. And then in Ordain, I went to Trinity Moravian Church, went to Hope Moravian Church, then back up to Moravian University and Seminary, and then to Hopewell, and then to King Outreach and Calvary Moravian Church, and then back to Hope the second time. <laughs> and then to Friedland, and then Bethania, and back to Hope the third time. Uh, I think it may, maybe that's a record, I don't know. And so now I'm uh, retired and I spend a lot of time going back and forth to different churches. So it's a joy to be with you today and to be part of your worship experience and to celebrate with you your anniversary month. 
and I told the guys that I met on the way in, I'm kind of like the Ed McMahon for Charlie Fischel. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 I'm there, and here's Charlie. <laughs> so that's what I'm doing today to celebrate with you. Now, I may be going out on a limb to say this, but I bet at least 1% of our congregation here today are babies in the family they grew up in. Let me know if I'm right. If you're the youngest child in your family, would you raise your hand? Okay, so okay, I wasn't, okay, wasn't too far off, okay. Me, I was the baby. As the youngest member of my family growing up, I had a front row seats in all things that are family, good and bad. And yes, as you might imagine, I didn't have a voice, at least when it came to my brother's thinking, oh, he's just a baby they would say. But being the youngest on a positive side, I got to listen to their music. They were four and eight years older. I learned how to correctly polish my shoes. I learned about the popular cars of the day, learning how to shave, playing roller bat, 500, tossing a new invention called a frisbee. And of course, from them, I learned out what was cool, hip, groovy, like Fonzie, yay. When my older brothers moved away, I was one who had all the chores to do at the house, but I was still the youngest. I wasn't always looked upon as being capable or able to handle the challenge. I was only in high school and not very mature. In fact, my dad said, when I turned 16, I asked him one time, I said, Dad, can I get my license now? He said, sure. I said, great, that'd be wonderful. He said, but you can't drive my car. <laughs> okay. Can I drive someone else's car? No. Can I get a car? No. So you're saying it's probably not a good idea for me to get my car, is that what you're saying? Pretty much. He didn't think I was mature enough to handle that responsibility and thank God for dads. Maybe when Jesus took this child into his arms that day and showed it to the disciples, he realized it's not what others see in you, but what God sees in you that makes all the difference in the world. Now, growing up, I had the benefit of being in a loving, caring home with people around me that truly felt love and the love of God in their hearts. My father was part of the greatest generation, serving in World War II. He was a constant, willing worker. My mother died when I was nine, and my stepmother provided the support for our family. She helped us with our new normal. And my church family, my church mamas and daddies, loved me from birth and gave me the support for my faith development. All in all, my life has been blessed, but such is not the case in many families and with all children. In our country, in our state of North Carolina, many families suffer with violence, hunger, insecurity, and homelessness. Having spent a good deal of my working career with families in crisis at Sunnyside Ministry or King Outreach, I have seen firsthand the way in which children are often left behind. In Jesus' day, children did not live a life that was easy or safe. The website Powerful Jesus says it this way, the status of children in Jesus' time was complex influenced by societal norms, family structures, and harsh living conditions. While children were valued within their families, they had limited rights and faced high mortality rates. So, when Jesus reminded the disciples that day that true greatness is measured by helping the least, loving the other, and earlier about being neighbor to those in need, he drove home the point by physically lifting a child up in their midst and saying, yes, this child might be a baby, but this child is highly favored in God's kingdom. I've looked at that passage many times. I'm not sure if they gulped when they saw this child on Jesus' lap. I'm not sure, given their complex nature, if they understood or knew what it was about the kingdom of God 
or that in fact their view of the kingdom of God was very upside down. But when the one who was God became a recipient of the most horrible death known at that time, they I began to realize even the child among them is the greatest. Now being a part of any family is not easy. As we have heard in our epistle lesson today, a member of the family of God's means living in a way that honors God through a life lived with wisdom, peace, godly ways of living out our faith among people that we know and perhaps people that we do not know. I have found out that as people of faith, finding a dynamic, fruitful faith that lives in the midst of adversity and seeks peace with those in our world is often difficult. In our world, people often live as we have heard in our scripture for themselves, and that can be trying for people of faith. Like James, I think that our lives will be better, much better, if we live out our faith daily in words that say, I want to live in the way that I believe. Even our children pick up that truth when pressed. What makes their mom or their dad special? What makes their mom and dad someone they admire and love? This month marks my mother's birthday in 1919 and last May marked my father's birthday in 1917. Daddy lived to be 82 years of age, and as I said, mom died when I was young in 1964. And all parents have jobs to do in the house, do they not? They gave us instructions and wisdom and caring. However, I will tell you that my mom was a disciplinarian my brother said that dad was too tired when he got home from work to do anything with me. And I remember very clearly one time when my mom said, David, go out to the apple tree and get a switch. Ow. She made you go get the switch. You know, you didn't have a choice. You had to go out and pick out one. So mom made me go outside and get the switch. I went out and picked the switch off the apple tree I came back out. We were on the back stoop of the house. I had a dog. It was a Dalmatian, and his name was Spot. <laughs> and so mom, in her mom-like way, drew back. This is slow motion, folks. That switch, about ready to give one of my legs, and my dog Spot went, <laughs> I love that dog. <laughs> And she was a disciplinary in the house. But my dad had sayings, he'd like to talk us to death. I would tell people often, I would much rather get a whipping than listen to my dad talk. Not for one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 or 30 minutes saying the same thing over again. David, 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 yeah. But my dad had sayings and they were to the point and often made more of a practical advice to me in life as I got older. You've heard these saying, you can probably finish them in your own way. If you're going to do a job, you do it right the first time. One that's very familiar to most of them. A place for everything. Okay. When I asked how he was doing, this is what he would say. I'm upright in taking nourishment. I didn't even know what that meant back then. <laughs> When speaking with someone about someone that really wasn't up to par or treated themselves or others badly, he would say, those folks are plumb sorry. <laughs> Always return something borrowed better than you found it. Makes sense. And with three of us boys, that was an issue. And my favorite, which still applies to today in our world, listen more than you talk You've got two ears and one mouth. Daddy was always a good teller of wisdom. He was a faithful tender at Misma, my home church and worker. So in my mind, the father that often did not say very much about his faith, lived out his faith in sayings in subtle ways that helped me to be a better person. He was a Micah six, eight kind of person, my way of thinking. Today, as we have read for the book of James, 
when I think about James, the brother of Jesus, I believe that he heard his brother well. Now, as you know, he's not mentioned very often in the Gospels, but we see in James and later in the ministry of James, a person who made faith practical, real by his actions. And by his actions and his encounters with everyday people, he followed the example of Jesus, demonstrating the kingdom of God. You and I know living for Jesus is not easy, but loving others as Jesus loved is truly the way for peace in this world. We hear the scripture remind us again, and a child should lead them. It was just not a phrase or catchy slogan. It was a way for Jesus to say, this child, this often helpless, overlooked, innocent, perceptive little person is the way to the kingdom of God. I believe that being great is allowing others to be in a place of honor among ourselves. We hear again from scripture, whoever is to be greatest among you shall be your servant. You shall be your servant. A lot of my understanding of the kingdom of God has grown over the years in my encounters with people of faith. Over 40 plus years of ministry, the most important achievements that I have made is simply those encounters that I've had with others, not my accomplishments, but the encounters that I've had with others who showed me by their actions the truth of the gospel. Fall's a great time. I was born in October and uh, 1955. So in a couple of weeks, I'll be having my birthday. So uh, happy birthday to me. Anyway, um, we were at Hopewell and Hopewell is a rural church or ex rural church or ex suburban church. I don't even know what you call churches anymore that are in the right or uh, triad area. <clears throat> and we were outside. I think I was raking some leaves, it had a big yard. And I heard this drone, not one of those, but it's a droning sound. I thought, what is that sound? And it got louder. Thinking, what? I, I couldn't place the sound. It sounded familiar to me. And then in a the distance, I saw it. It was an old international riding lawnmower and only an elderly man. What's he doing? Why is he, why is he riding on the road with that old lawnmower? Came to find out he couldn't really see. That was how he got around. But what made it unusual is that in his lap, he had a quite large pumpkin, a pumpkin. And I'm thinking to myself, where is that man going with the pumpkin? And then he turned on to Hopewell Church Road, which goes to the parsonage. And he's coming my way. I didn't know who he was at that time. And so I thought, why is he coming? And then he pulls up in the driveway and he simply says, I thought you might want to have a pumpkin for the fall. And of course I said, well, thank you, Mr. Snyder. Mr. Snyder, thank you. He cranked the mower back up, went on his way back to his house. I came to find out this man had cared for both his wife who had cancer and a child who had special needs until they died. And as his sight became less and less, he used this mower to get back and forth and do his work that he did. He was a servant of God in his home and family and understood that it is better to give than receive. And yes, there have been countless others. I think back to my time at Trinity Moravian Church. There was a head usher there. His name was Mr. Byerly. He was affectionately known as a chewing gum man. And every time you would come into the church, he would give you a piece of chewing gum. I think he probably worked for Wrigley's. I'm not sure. Every time. But what made him exceptional is that when I walked in with the other pastor from the back, that's how we did it then, he would come up to me, he'd say, David, David, see that couple over there? You see them? She's Betty, and that's Jim. They have two children, and they're just moved here in the community. 
So when you go out, be sure to say hello to them. Okay. I, we, so as they left, after the benediction, after we left, and we were greeting people as they went out, I said, well, hey, Jim and Betty, they look at me like, like, how do you know my name? It was Mr. Barley. Mr. Barley had that kind of recall, kind of like Norwood Green. He had that recall that he could remember people just at a drop of a hat. And he kept us informed as pastors of who was at church, who was absent, who had been sick, and he was a valued asset. He did it not for fame or glory. He did it to be a servant of God. I think about my time at, LMA, at Hope Moravian Church. We had a lady who taught the ladies' Bible class, Ella Mae Johnson. Ella Mae was a significant leader. She wrote an outdoor drama for the people of Hope and led by example by her teaching the Sunday school class, even when sight would not help her. And she led the church by example on the board. One of the first women board members on the board of elders at Hope Moravian Church. I remember my good friends at Hopewell, Otis and Elma Heggie. Otis and Elma were phenomenal people. They, along with their family, would make and put together pickled doorknob peppers. How many people have ever had a pickled doorknob pepper? Does anybody know what they are? Okay, they're just like those little green peppers and you put cabbage in them and you pickle them. They're really tasty. They would make thousands of those, thousands of those and sell them. And when I first came to Hopewell, I said, well, what do you do with the money? Give it to the church. So after I got to know them a little bit, I said, uh, Otis, I said, have you ever thought just giving the money to the church? No, that would be too easy. <laughs> okay. He said, we do this to show God that we love him and we appreciate the, the crops that he has given us. And we share that money with the church. Amazing God. I think about people like Scott Brent at Freeland who often would call me and say, David, I need your help. He was a track coach at North Forsyth, but he was a great faithful member at Freeland. And he said, always, I'm ready, willing, and able. And I think about Dr. Tom Styers, who was a dentist in the community, a member of Bethania, who came to me when I was working at King Outreach and said, our church wants to help people in need. Can you point me to a group of people at your ministry that need help, extra help? This? And so we did. We gave them gift cards, presents, so they could have a beautiful Merry Christmas. You see, being a child of God is not about how famous you are, how many accolades you have ascribed, the degrees on the wall. Being a child of God, a faithful servant of Christ, is about living out that faith, being willing to be used as a servant, to model Jesus' life in your actions, in your daily walk, and even at times laying down one's life for his friends. As you approach this anniversary, I want you to do a little exercise with me. It's one I've done a couple of times at other churches, and I think you might find it hopeful and helpful. Those of you who have been here for a while know many people, but you also know many people who are no longer here who've made that transition from this life to the life eternal. I want you in your mind's eye, as you sit here in the pews, to think about those people today as you approach anniversary. I want to think about you to think about what they did, maybe the jobs that they had at this church, maybe the encounter that you had with them, maybe even as a family member. I want to think about where they sit in this church. You know, we all have places we sit in church. We have places that we prefer. Think about where they sit. Now imagine in your mind's eye, imagine in your mind's eye that you are seeing them in a spiritual way again, sitting among us. I believe the communion of saints those who have met Jesus face to face in heaven are still with us. Not physically, but in our hearts, we carry them. And I believe that they are here today cheering us on 
and our ministry and our walk with the Lord. Imagine them here in that pew. What would they say to you? How would they greet you? Would they embrace you? Would they shake your hand? Would they ask you how you're doing? Think about what they gave to you, what they gave to this church and community. Think about how they influenced your life and made your walk with Jesus much better. Whoever, whoever wants to be a follower of Jesus Christ must be slave and servant of all. Let us pray. Gracious God, in this hour we have come to reflect on your mercy and your grace, not just for us, but for the world. Yes, we are sinners saved by grace. We are people of faith on a journey. And yes, we need encouragement from those around us, our brothers and sisters, and we need to be encouragers to those around us as well. We thank you that you give us life, life eternal. We thank you give us an abundant life that we can share with others around us now. And through our actions and our words and how we put ourselves out in the community, we have the power to change a life, to change our world one person at a time by kind words, by gentle actions, by opportunities to share and care for people who are often overlooked, the least of these, the children, the people in our community who have needs. Bless and keep us, Lord, in your way and help us to see the child among us always. In your name we pray, amen.